Go on. Think of the Second All right. Good afternoon. Uh, I think we've uh, we're about ready to roll. I can say good afternoon, and we'll try to keep this moving along because I can see the catering truck has pulled up out front. Um, I'll get it started, but then John's going to take over real quick and do the first part of it. Um, my name is Gary Banks. This is uh, John Keyser. Uh, basically, you can tell where we're from and all that. Um, I'm not going to get mic'd up because, like I say, John's going to come on in here. Um, let me see. Hopefully you're in the right room. And what we're going to do here is go over. John's going to talk about the process. He's a little bit more reality based. And then kind of as we're getting down to the end of this whole nine yards, I'm going to get out there a little bit on some theory stuff about this Internet cafe. What is it? What could it be? And stuff like that. Uh, and then at the end, obviously, we'll have some questions, answers, comments before we run out and play volleyball. <clears throat> but um, I think as with John and myself, clearly, if you have questions, uh, even if it's one we think we're going to cover later on, we can say, well, we'll cover that. Good point. Um, we'll give you the $5 for leading us along, or we can go ahead and discuss. So it's not really, it doesn't have to be quite structured as a presentation. Uh, and the last piece I'll do here is the traditional audience identification, because my, I want to make sure I'm, we're kind of couching this the right way. Everybody, the, the quick show or non-show of hands. Um, how many librarians do I have? Okay. Oh, very good. Thank you. And uh, teaching faculty, law faculty, anybody still hanging around? Very good. Thank you for doing that. Uh, and I say techies. This is more a way to give you an insight into my piece when I say administrators. I'm, I'm now a chief information officer, so I don't do the work anymore. Um, so I want to know how many people are kind of in that bailiwick where this is a theory question, you know, but we don't actually get hit with actually making our plans go when we say make it so. And then, the, and then who are the techies that actually make me look Good. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we've got a good mix here, so we'll try to hit all the different parts. Okay. I'll go ahead and turn over that piece so you can flip over. Okay. Thanks. And uh, I guess my role is as Associate Dean of Administration and Technology at Washington and Lee, I am also more like Gary in terms of I am out of the day-to-day -day support uh, technology arena, but only, only so for about a year. Um, so... I still remember the pain, but I no longer sympathize with it. Um, okay, I will start out just by saying a little bit about Washington and Lee because we're probably the least known uh, law school in the country. Um, 360 students, 35 full-time faculty, 50 full-time staff, 11 to 1 student teacher ratio. Student-centered in a very, very real way. I mean, student-centered is not a, an empty marketing slogan at Washington and Lee. It is, in fact, the thing that drives all services at Washington and Lee, including technology services and, uh, and media services. And it creates many wonderful opportunities and many wonderful challenges at the same time. We are relatively small. And there are a lot of advantages to being as small as we are uh, because we're much more administratively nimble, I think. And, uh, and the decisions and the team that gets together to make those decisions is very, very tight and is a very, very good environment in which to work, both as an administrator and a person doing technology support on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, that small administrative staff also creates some stress issues. I am, I am now Associate Dean for Administration and Technology, and administration is everything that the academic dean and the student dean doesn't want to do. So my official uh, areas of, of responsibility are institutional research, facilities, budget, and technology. So the summers are exceptionally busy for me. Um, but administration really means everything that doesn't fall in either of those other two categories. So it's a, uh, it's a great environment in which to work, but it does create its stress given how thinly administratively staffed we are. Although I won't gain sympathy from some of you, I'm sure. Um, the other advantage or, or sometimes cre creates a challenge at Washington and Lee is it's a relatively wealthy institution. 
And cost is very rarely a determining factor about whether you get to do something or not. So you really have to change your orientation away from necessarily what does it cost to can we in fact support that over the long term. So it's not a function of can we do it? It's in fact you want to say that you can do some things. You know, you have to actually reverse your orientation to say it's not the money that's holding us up, but it is in fact the ability to support that over time. So we make some fairly, uh, fairly controversial decisions because sometimes it's harder for us to justify not doing something because they know the money is actually is actually there and available. Um, Washington Lee has a very strong honor system. A Carroll culture, meaning that every student who comes to the school was assigned a Carroll, and the building is open 24-7. There are almost no security issues at Washington Lee, and at the end I'll show you a picture of where our school is, and you'll understand why there are no buildings. <laughs> no <coughs> security issues. Uh, technology services in the law school, there's a central university computing department, obviously, and they provide for us almost all of the services they provide for us, our email server, all of our file and print storage, all of our network services. Um, they provide almost all of the infrastructural support needs. We have several servers in the law school that we maintain, but they are largely for our own production purposes. They run our, our help desk tracking software and all the ASP uh, applications that we write. Um, but for the most part, university computing handles our backups, our server structure, our network infrastructure. I know some of you want to work for me now. Um, they also handle the replacement budget. They tell us that they, well, we basically configure what we would like for a replacement budget, and they say yes or no to that. But then we, we manage the replacement process in total. Um, University Computing also has a satellite support structure, which included law until about three years ago when we broke away and became our own service reporting directly to the dean. Um, small, flexible, and aggressive. I say regress, aggressive because we're we're all relatively young. We all just basically do things, and then we get resented by the under, undergraduate side because we're able to do things in this one building. Like, for instance, the wireless network. The network and systems team didn't want us to put a wireless network in. Dirk, my tech, technician, and myself came in at 4.30 one morning, and we stuck 10 access points up in the ceiling, and, and we said, we have a wireless network. And, uh, <laughs> and I told the network and systems guy, if you want to make that secure, you want to do anything you know, to, to make these connections better, let me know. So, so that's what I mean by, by aggressive and resented. Um, my perspective my perspective is kind of unusual in the sense that my training is actually in the social sciences and quantitative methods and organizational sociology. So I have a, a very, very different perspective than some about technology. Um, I had taught at a college for eight years. I then came to Washington and Lee as basically in an attempt to change back into the technology arena as basically the PC support person just six years ago. And so I was the sole support person in the law school for three years and then eventually parlayed that under the arrival of a new dean to director of technology and research services where I directed myself for a year. <laughs> I said, go, you know, go fill up the paper and the printer and then I'd run and do it. And I came back and I said, I got that done. Um, and then eventually we, we got another position and then another position and then we, we grabbed media services out of the library. So that brought two full-time FTEs and then we got two half-time positions that basically serve as the people who, who enter calls into the, to the database and, and provide the first tier of support. So we're up to six full-time equivalents if you count me, but you really can't count me because I don't do anything. Um, and we have a very, very strong uh, service orientation, and I try to analyze the decision. I, I think more in a sociological sense in terms of the political and social context in which decisions are made and how things go about happening, especially in, in higher education. And um, I, I think that's why we've been so successful in terms of, of, of increasing the staff, because we had a new dean come in. When the new dean came in, we, we negotiated a change in my position and a new position, and that's when the dean has power, when they're negotiating their job. And then a year later, we had a new president come in on the undergraduate side, and that's when we negotiated the restructuring of the administrative side in law school. So knowing when and how decisions are made in the academic context can be very, very helpful. Okay, now actually to the wireless implementation. Um, as we've mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about our process, although really what I want to focus on is what the impact of the wireless has been, because two or three years ago when Gary and I started doing these talks together about wireless networks, we were really, it was like who had a wireless network and who did not have a wireless network and, 
and almost, well, there were some who had it, but they were fairly early adopters. Gary was a very early adopter at UVA. Um, we then kind of rode on their coattails and got it about uh, three years ago. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what happened throughout that. Let me just actually see a show of hands. How many schools in here have a, a wireless network that covers most of their law school? Okay, and how many have none? Okay, so see, that's exactly what we're saying. And how many of you had it more than three years ago? So, okay. So one or two there. So, yeah, so that's exactly what we're talking about. So I don't want to focus necessarily. This group is clearly beyond the point of saying, well, what happened and how? what did we learn? What we're really looking at is what did we learn from the process and what can you expect to see in the next couple of years or so? And maybe you've seen the, the same things already. Um, again, I, I'll just breeze through these then because most of you already had this. The external resistance was one thing we had to, we had to battle a lot because the undergraduate um, network and system group is exceptionally conservative and they still don't have a wireless network on the undergraduate side as a result. But they were, you know, poor talking to speed, talking about security concerns, talking about support concerns. Um, and then we looked at early adopters like UVA and, and we implemented it despite the resistance, as I mentioned before, in a 430 raid. Um, on the law school. Um, processes to continuously monitor and evaluate and improve the wireless network, uh, quantify the demand for the service. That's one thing that we found very, very, very helpful in terms of supporting it politically is actually gathering information about who is using it, how often they're using it, what are they using it for, and then advertise those testimonials to people because that makes a huge difference. When, you, when I come in to talk to our Board of Trustees, our Law Committee of the Board of Trustees, or when I talk to the, uh, what we call our Law Council, which is our Alumni Advisory Board, if I can bring into them these testimonials, it creates a buzz and it creates an excitement about that, about that wireless network. And the expansion of that is very, very easy to accomplish at that point. Um, and stressing the empowerment of the, of the students. And again, that has a lot of play at Washington and Lee. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And, and in fact, Gary, that's one of the things Gary wants to focus on in terms of how it's really changed the way education and the pedagogy has been being done in the law school. Okay. I want to look a little bit about the implications that we've seen at Washington and Lee in terms of implementation of the, uh, implementation of the wireless, and perhaps your experience is the same. At Washington and Lee, we do not have a laptop requirement for students, but Almost all of our students come with a computer. 97% own at least one computer, and that's been relatively consistent over the last three years. 85% now own a laptop, and that's up fairly considerably from, from when we first implemented the wireless network. That's up almost 20% there from, from 01. 43% say they own a desktop, and that's, that's, rel that's dropping slightly, but it's relatively consistent. And 29% say they own multiple machines. They own both a desktop at home and a laptop. So that was 16% in, in 01. So that, again, is a 13% increase. And 21% say they bring a PDA. Now, the last point is, is the one that is most interesting. And, and as a person who is also responsible for facilities at Washington and Lee, it's a very, very interesting question about how the wireless network has impacted our facility, our facility use by our students. We asked them on this annual survey, how often did you use the machines? Do you use them on a daily basis or on a more than daily or multiple times during the day? Um, and, and these are the responses that we saw in 01, 02, and, and 03. Remember, we implemented our wireless network just before the 01 uh, survey was, was put out. So 78% or almost 80% said they were using it then, and now 40% say they're using it now. So on a daily basis, do you go to a lab or public machine? That figure has been, been cut in half at Washington and Lee. Um, so what does that mean for the way we use our facilities, and what does that mean for the resources that we provide our students at Washington and Lee or at other places? Have, have you guys seen that similar, a similar trend? Yeah, when, when we first put the wireless network in, we were told that the, that the utilization of the public machines was going to decrease. And we did not find that immediately. As you can see, we found a slight drop off in the first year. But now that we're in the second year of this and everybody's coming in now with a laptop with a wireless network, it's dropped off very, very considerably. And in fact, there are times where you can walk by our main lab, which is 25 
uh, PCs, you can walk by the main lab where there is not an individual in the lab. And uh, the key here is at Washington and Lee, everybody always, a lot of our students always bought laptops. They just wouldn't bring them to campus. They'd leave them at home and they'd serve as a desktop in their apartment. With the wireless network, there's a much more of an incentive to bring them into the law school. And then if you can solve the printing problem and give them access to public printers, and you can solve a couple of problems in terms of your facilities, the utilization of your public machines will decrease fairly considerably, I think. Okay, implications, implications for the classroom. Obviously, the wireless network has, is, will allow us and has allowed us to kind of leverage the other resources that we already have available. And, and many of you already have these as well. Network drives for classes where they can drop their work into the network drive and the faculty member can then pick it up, uh, Blackboard or other things. And it's really pushing and creating a need for us to develop portal services, I think, within the law school. And again, we're, we're facing resistance from the undergraduate side, but we're kind of pushing ahead with some type of portal services fairly soon, I think. In terms of we've got all these resources available now, now it just makes sense to get them into a uh, a single user login, username, password situation where they can get access to all of these things asynchronously anywhere in the law school. Um, and then, as many of you have, have already mentioned and has been mentioned on Technoid several times, there's this big debate out there about what, what has been the impact of wireless in the classroom and how has that impacted the educational process. And what I, the way I've approached it is I say the wireless network to me is just like any any other thing that can distract the student during the course of a lecture. And the way I've approached it is try to educate the faculty in terms of what it is they can do on their laptop where they're sitting there acting like they're listening to you. And, and then how you should build in the appropriate policies into the syllabus just like you do for anything else in, into the syllabus. You know, the wireless network is not responsible for people not paying attention in class, okay? I didn't pay attention in class when I was in college and I didn't have a wireless network. Um, you know, it's a function of what it is. You mean, you could be sitting there reading for another class. You could be sitting there playing solitaire on, the, on your own laptop or whatever it is that you are gaming on your own laptop. Now, with the wireless network, you can clearly be IMing the person across the, uh, across the seat or you can be engaged in an inter interactive video game. Uh, competing against the person across the hallway. So I try to approach it just like any other distraction in the class, and I tell faculty members, if they don't want their students connecting to the wireless network, if they don't want their students surfing the web, if they don't want their students checking their email, then establish a syllabus policy for that. And at Washington and Lee, because of the honor code, that actually means something. I don't know how much that would, that would impact at your particular institution. You would know that better than I. Um, <coughs> Clearly, what we found in the first year when we implemented the wireless network was an, a massive support implication, a massive support implication. Prior to the wireless network, we were configuring roughly 30 systems a year. The first year we implemented the wireless network, we touched 120 systems. Um, and for us, we were a Novell shop. We put the Novell client group-wise antivirus software and upgrade their office to a, a, a site license uh, XP version, so that is a fair amount of work uh, to touch all of those. And then they get a virus, they get, you know, NIMDA or whatever, and then they come back to us and say, I can't use my computer anymore, so we rebuild that. Um, so the virus proliferation was another question that came into play, and that forced us to go to a, a campus-wide Norton antivirus site license as well. So, and, and we require now that they have that on their machine before they connect to the network. And we push out the, we push out the uh, updates of that to their laptop as well. Um, it's also allowed us to expand the services into th places like the law review or the clinics where they're fairly tight spaces and they all have cubicles and they all want, they all wanted, you know, desktop systems within the clinic, but you can only put, you know, two desktop, two desktops in the clinic of 20 students. And now the students will just bring their laptop into the clinic or into the law review. And it's kind of reduced the demand for those, those public machines as well. Printers is another big issue that is really driven that, that once they had the wireless network, then they wanted access to be able to configure a printer on the fly relatively easily and be able to print anywhere in the building. So that's another support implication. Um, 
data backup. You, I think we have to provide them some capability to, to back up their, what they're storing locally up to the network drive, so in case their machine does, does fail on them, then we can just go in and re-image that machine and then hand them, hand them the machine back and they'll be back up and running. Um, and then security, security in the sense of the wireless network security, which I won't get into. I know there were other talks here at Cali. But also then the theft issue, you've got many, many more laptops laying around the law school. And at Washington and Lee, it's fairly rare that, that a theft will occur, but it certainly has increased as a result of the fact that now you've got 300 students le leaving laptops around. It's a much more target-rich environment. But still, we only lose a laptop or two a year um, within the building, which is not bad considering that it's open 24-7. And then the other big impact for me is rethinking the ecological design or, or the facilities issue in terms of how we go about using the space that we're using. Um, a couple of things we did in support, I mean, in response to the support implications were that we, we kind of had to lay down the rule. We're, we're fairly lenient about what we do for student laptops, and, but we had to kind of lay down a rule that says, if you buy a pre-configured system, we will provide you the support for free. Which means if you buy in this in this year, we're we're offering three three Dells: the D400, the D600, the D800. Um, if you buy one of those pre-imaged with our software already on it, with the client on it, with Groupwise on it, with XP, with Norton Antivirus on it, then if you have a problem, we will manage. We will work on your laptop for free. Um, if your machine goes south, we will hand you a loaner until we get yours re-imaged, okay? So that's, that's kind of the incentive for them to buy the pre-configured systems that most students do. Um, if you do not buy that, you're welcome to bring another machine, but then we will charge you for, that, for the services we provide for you, and that's like $40 an hour for that, for that uh, PC support. We also went to a software licensing agreement, as I mentioned before, with Norton. We also have Office XP, where all the students can now load XP. Uh, on Office XP onto their machine. We then also put Novell, Netware, et cetera, on the systems. And we're moving to more things like iPrint and Net Storage to try to solve the issue of configuring a print, printer on the fly and also e more easily accessing uh, network resources over, over an IP network. And then my tech technicians also get Dell certified so because that makes life a lot easier. I don't know if you guys have a person in-house in who is certified for your main vendor, but having Dell certification saves you a ton of time and a ton of headache. You can call and say the motherboard's bad, and they say, okay, you know, and they ship it to him. Um, whereas if you're not, you're on hold, and, and then you have to convince the guy that you've done everything that, that they think you should do. Okay, implications in terms of the facilities. The wireless network has really changed our kind of conception about how the students use the building. And um, um, the nature of the study spaces, access to printers, access to caffeine, um, and it has had a massively strong influence on building decisions. Um, perhaps that's because I am so involved in the facilities decisions as well as the technology decisions, but I think overall the success of the wireless network has really has created so much goodwill among the students in the administration of the law school that it really now influences the decisions that are being made. So I think it's really given additional weight to the student needs and additional credibility to technology and media services for what we say. And so as a result, we have a master plan for renovating the building. And as a result of that, a new cafe and, and, and improved student spaces have, have really been um, moved up in terms of the renovation plan because it's really seen that they really need these spaces to work in in a, in a collaborative and interactive way. And although we have some of them now, they're fairly poor spaces. So I think the success of the wireless network has actually driven facilities questions and, and actually much to the advantage of the students uh, in terms of the student space getting first, first choice. <clears throat> Some of the opportunities I think the wireless network has provided us is obviously you don't have to extend the wired, more cost effective. It's allowed us to create a mobile teaching lab um, where we've got one of these big, I call it a pizza oven. It's just a massive uh, 
uh, laptop cart with 30 laptops in it. We can roll that into any classroom we want to and turn it into a lab. If we want to do Lexus and Westlaw training, we can just hand the laptops off as they come into the room, and they can just use the wireless network and not have to connect in or anything. Uh, again, the clinics and the law review and other journal spaces, it's really created, it, it's alleviated the demands on those public machines in those spaces. And it's decreased the demand for the public machines. As I mentioned before, 41% of the public machines, 41% um, of the students report using the public machines on a daily or multiple times in, in a day basis. Um, what we've done, what we're going to go to this year, and, and um, Gary came up with the title, Close the Computer Lab. What we're going to go with, since the students really view the computer lab as the place where they do academic work, um, See, the problem is with the wireless network and in the Carroll culture, the Carroll culture is really the social scene. So if you're in your Carroll, there's a fair amount of talking and people come by and, and talk to you about what you're going to do tonight, um, where you're going tonight or whatever. So it's a fairly social area. The, the computer lab has really been defined as the place where the academic work gets done. So what we're going to do this year, instead of actually closing the computer lab, we're pulling machines out of the computer lab and leaving those spaces open for students to just bring their laptop in and work with their laptop in the lab. So we're removing about 10 of the 25 machines out of the lab and allowing students to just bring their own laptop in. And it's because our, obviously our demand for our public machines has decreased, so we're realizing some savings there, but it's also allowing the students to maintain that environment which is academic in nature, so they can walk in there and still do their work in the lab um, and still utilize that resource, but not complete. So we're basically turning into a main reading room, if you will, so that that's a place where they can go and it's quiet and they can work on academic stuff. Um, and it's created, obviously, this flexibility in building decisions and facilitated group work and collaboration. So now the students can jump in a hallway and five of them can sit on the floor there in the hallway or, or camp out on the sofas and they can work on their, on their group projects and outlines in a much, much better way than they used to be able to. Okay, wireless lessons learned. It was more wildly successful than we ever, ever dreamed it would be. It's been created an, an incredible stock of goodwill with the students. And uh, of course, never to, to uh, let that goodwill go untapped. We are implementing a technology fee um, in, the, in the fall, which will be $200 a year per student. And literally, we implemented this technology fee, and I had not received one email that was negative about the technology fee at all. So it's created a situation in which they understand that they're getting these additional resources, and they understand that somebody eventually has to pay for those. And so that additional revenue is a revenue stream that we're able to realize as a result of the success of that wireless network. Um, it's also forced a very, very challenging but rewarding kind of face-to-face -face interaction with the students where we now are dealing with them on a daily basis about what, how they're using the wireless network, what they're using it for, what they would like to see different. We've got a student advisory committee that is much, much more active now than it used to be. Uh, the students are just very, very interested and very, very locked into the technology decisions. And that's how we made the decision of pulling public machines out of the public lab. You know, we were thinking we we're going to pull all the other public machines out, stick them in the lab, and the lab was going to be the only place you could go to do this stuff, and we're just going to pull all the other public machines out of circulation because we've got public machines tucked everywhere. Um, but they said, no, pull some of the machines out, allow us to go in there with our laptop because that's really the place where everybody views that as a place where you go to work. You don't go to talk if you go into the computer lab. So. That feedback and that face-to-face -face interaction with the students has been very, very successful and very, very rewarding. Um, it's forced us to address these support issues in creative and constructive ways and um, made us realize that wiring, you know, switched 100 to the desktop was probably a mistake um, four years ago. A lot of money. Um, more lessons learned. learned uh, learn from early adopters. Don't wait until it's perfect. All of you obviously already taken that advice because you all almost all have uh, wireless networks. Um, forced to come to grips with the student support model. It also allowed us to pro provide for the administration very quantitative evidence that, that the support for these services was increasing and allowed us to create a, a justification for another uh, staff position. And it provided the justification for a software license agreement with Microsoft Office and Norton Antivirus, 
which then allows your ghost image to be much, much more effective because then you can put that stuff on the ghost image even with Dell. Dell will put, drop that on the ghost image for you and then sell that, that laptop pre-configured or pre-imaged. So that's been very, very helpful. And here's why we don't have a security issue. Um, so there are not many people kind of trolling around the law school looking for wireless connectivity. So. That's all I had. Do you want, to, you want me to take questions now or do you want to? Um, any questions of me? Yes. John, we have a uh, uh, completely wired network. All the seats in the library, a vocabulary, uh, table seating, group study rooms, uh, and every seat in the classrooms are, uh, are, are networked uh, and, uh, and used. We have not found that the computer labs are any less used. Computer labs are still full. Even though most of the students bring a laptop and plug in anywhere in the school with our standard Ethernet connection, we have not found the decrease of use in the, uh, in the computer lab. If you're finding almost a 50% reduction based upon wire network, we're not seeing the same results with the wire right? And we had the same thing. We had wired. We had wired uh, everywhere, in, not everywhere in the building, but we had. It was a fairly prolific wired culture there before we went to wireless. And we saw absolutely no indication, even though most of our students were coming with laptops, that demand for the public machines was decreasing. Because that wired connection, that tether, is very, very different, you know, in terms of the, the way they use it than this wireless network where it's everywhere, it's outside, they can go sit outside and work. And, and then once they are using that to that degree, they want everything available on their laptop. So they want the ability to print, they want all those other resources. Once you give them that, then I, I, I assure you that the, that the demand will decrease for your public machines. And I was very, very skeptical of that because, as you said, we had a lot of students with laptops, we had a lot of network connections, but our demand was not decreasing. But it's, it's dropped 50% in the last two years since the wireless network. Since, time, since we did that uh, almost four years ago, we created an outdoor patio now. And so we're getting some requests for connectivity outside. And that's why we're thinking about putting up a few access points uh, and putting some uh, uh, some network loaners, uh, notebook loaners behind the circulation desk with wireless cards, and let students go and use those to work outside if they want to do that. Yeah, what I what I found is that you know what you do in that instance is you actually increase their dependence on their machine, so that the public machine use actually goes up. Um, it'll only go down if they think they can do everything on that laptop that they need to do on a daily basis. So I think. Even a couple of access points isn't going to decrease your demand for the public machines. I think absolute full coverage of your building and then giving them access to all the services they think they need on that particular laptop will decrease the, the public access. Yeah, Bob. I think that we're seeing in our computer labs is that there are Carol's and many other, you know, dozens of public machines in different locations. And I see many students who are working with the desktop and the laptop next to it. I'm not sure what they're doing, but it looks like they're doing some sort of legal work. <laughs> legal or illegal? What'd you say? <laughs> yeah, we we see that too. Where they'll slide the flat panel monitor over, they'll set their laptop there, and they'll be doing two machines at once. I mean, if you go in our offices, we all have two, you know, two or three machines in our offices too. And we're flipping back and forth, and I guess they're used to that. Yeah. Our printing is controlled through P counter, and basically. Um, we pre-configure all of the printers that are available to them, and, and we have a, a kind of an interesting scheme where they print to a queue if they want to charge it to themselves. They print to another queue and we, if they want to charge it to the group for which they are printing, like law review or if they are a research assistant. They just print to a, a different queue. Then a box pops up and says, which of these groups do you belong to? And they select that group, and it can actually be billed to the special group in addition to being billed to themselves. So those two things are separated out. And then at the end of the year, we provide a summary to Law Review that, you know, Jones J printed 4,000 pages. Does that seem realistic? And here's a list of the print jobs that they did. And then let them sort that out because the Law Review is the one that's billed. Um, but we pre-configured that. We're moving to other solutions now that are more like iPrint, which is more like a web-based thing where they can go pick the printer that they want and get configured for their client. Well, we're implementing that this summer. Hopefully, that'll be ready in the fall. But in the past, when we touched their machine at the beginning of the year, we configured all of the public queues on their laptops. And that really, really decreased the demand for the, for the public machines. Because clearly, what they were doing is working on their laptop and then moving over and printing it in the, in the lab.
Yeah. Printers are located all over the place. We've got, yeah, we've got, um, you know, every corner in which we think there is a fair amount of uh, utilization with the wireless network, we just stuck a printer. And they have a, a, a number of options. You know, we only have 150,000 square feet, and they probably have, you know, 12 public printers, you know, scattered throughout the, all the different areas of where they can print. Yeah. I know that our class, our labs have not decreased also, but in terms of foot traffic, it has, it has not decreased. In terms of the length of time using it has decreased in students. For us, coming to your question, right. we, we have a, um, a VPN on top of the wireless, so before they can get into the wireless, they have to access the VPN. And some of the students don't like the actual length of time of getting in. The lab machines are not locked down to that extent. They don't have to log in twice. So they prefer those quick hits versus getting up to the machine. So they're just zipping in, checking email or whatever they got to do, and, and then moving on in between classes or whatever. Good point. Yeah. Yeah, and in Washington Lee, we have the kind of main lab, and then we have a couple of areas very near the classrooms where we've got seven, uh, you know, seven public workstations or five public workstations, and those places, I mean, we, we track the login and logout activity of those machines, and they are just hammered, you know, where if they didn't bring their laptop or whatever, they just go in there and check their email. But the lab utilization and the public utilization in general is, is, is down, but you're right. When they are using it, they're using it for very, very short periods of time, and Checking their email, moving on. Okay, we'll hold, maybe hold the other questions, let Gary go through, and then we can answer some questions at the end. All right, John. Okay, keep it moving along. We have the 22 minutes to go. Um, I got three sections here why I decided to give this talk, and there's a couple of good reasons for that. Um, then I thought I'd go ahead and define what I think a cafe is going to look like, some features, definitions, and my thinking on what this is going to appear. And uh, actually, I want to make sure that you understand this is my experimental design. I've not deployed and done all this. This is an upcoming this year event. So this is more of a way really for you to tell me to tell you why I'm moving forward in this particular direction, and uh, it could be a success or a failure, but part of this whole thing, as we heard in the plenary on Wednesday or Thursday, is uh, sometimes the experiments blow up or whatever, but I'm going to give it a shot. And I'll look for some feedback if you have some suggestions on modifying my design, either you know today or later on as you think about it, um, and I'll clearly pass on success next year or failure. Um, why the talk? Well, you know, we always talk about faculty, how are they going to use it in, in class, and how are they going to adopt technology, and how do they use it, and that's important, and that it exists. But I have the good fortune also to deal with students, and as we know, there's a different type of talk you can talk with a student, uh, and they use technology in a different kind of way. There's a wide range of skills that the students have when I meet with them, I mean, but there's, they, they clearly have a good understanding of technology and how they want to use it in ways that make sense to them, not necessarily in ways I intend for them to use it. They also, in my case, have numbers. I have a, a good-sized student body, but one that I can get my head on. I have about 1,150 or 1,200 students, so every year I get to see 360 new kids, if you, students, sorry, come in and see what they know that makes their third-year peers look antiquated. You know, and, I, and I've been there long enough to now say, oh, I remember the class of 2000, they were hot because they had wireless, and now the other guys, you know, they're all used to that, and they've moved on. Um, and I've found students very innovative. I spent a little bit more time with them this year than usual doing not the tech support stuff, but actually just kind of talking to them and saying, here's what I tell you, what do you really think? And I find that they're very innovative, and there's more of them, and if they're technically savvy and they're driven, and there's new ones coming in all the time. I, you know, the idea is, you know, maybe catch the wave here and, and see what's going to happen. So I'm going to try something a little different. Um, there's also a tech component that's driving me to think this this way. We'll see how radical it is. Um, we did the wireless for us four years ago. I did the management thing of, okay, how do we buy it? When do we buy it? What do we deploy? We 
the, the notebook requirement and all those things, and that was you know exciting and very practical and management oriented of me. But you know, it's like okay, we've done that four years. All exams have been done on computers. We've done. I mean, okay, I want to have fun. I think I want to have some fun coming up here, and. Um, I want to tap into what I thought was the success of the method of the way we rolled out and decided to do wireless and notebooks and the way that the community, as you say, we built goodwill. We weren't successful. We didn't do everything perfectly the first time. There was a lot of confusion. But then nonetheless, the community as a whole, I want to give them a lot of credit, the faculty, the staff, and the administration, that they were open and we moved forward and we modified and we're getting pretty good about it and stuff. And then it dawned on me as I went through this conference this week, and this is the one where I, I'll make a note. Some part of it is me. I'm, I'm 40. Maybe I'm hitting this 40 thing, and I want to have a little bit of fun personally, and it's really about me, and I want to make it ecocentric and not necessarily about the law school or the students. So there might be a component here that's driven, I think, a little bit by me. Um, we'll see how well this goes. If not, I'll cut it off. And I want to give you an example of one of the things that happened There it is. The students have this show. They all, a lot of schools have it where they put on um, you know, a spoof where they have an entertainment variety show. And without any intervention and without me being involved in it at all, other than being a, I was actually in the play or whatever this video, they do this digital video. And, I, and, I, and it's not beautiful. I don't want to give you a sense of Spike Lee kind of stuff. But let me, let me show you what, you know, without me being involved, it's hard to see. This is the dean driving into the law school. He's the godfather. It's a spoof on the professor, or the sopranos. They called it the professor. But they're doing quick cuts. They got people involved. They, did, they knew how to script it and shoot the video. Um, they got a lot of professors involved with it. It was a fun thing. And this is clearly not academic, but it was a community exercise. But the technology is what I was looking at while they were doing it. Let me go ahead and cut it off. Um, so the point, again, is, I mean, they got their own equipment. They didn't come to me and say, Gary, would you buy this or could you let me loan it? They went out and did it. They edited it. They did the transitions. They did the spin. There's talent out there. There's innovation, and they are motivated to do it. Now, whether there turns out to be an academic use of that same kind of technology and spirit is what I'm going to try to tap into here. Okay? We'll see how well it works. That was the example. So where are we today? Um, I'm very fortunate, so I'm not even going to talk about how this whole thing is, but I'm making a lot of assumptions, and if they come, pardon me, come out as questions, that's fine. <clears throat> we do have wireless everywhere. We do for fee printing. We have the printers everywhere around the building. Uh, they can do it printing directly from their wireless notebook. Um, we've done our exams on computers for four years. Uh, Let's see, what else do we have? We have an extensive intranet with, of course, home pages, blind grading numbers, you know, pictures on lines. I mean, there's a whole bundle of services from calendaring and all that that are available. So there's a lot of things that you have to assume are going on here. They've got their, you know, downloads and manage network at Norton Antivirus. They've got their file and print sharing going on. Uh, we take Visa and MasterCard, so when they run out of there, we give them 500 pages, for instance, every term. And when they want to update, they can do a $5 recharge 24-7 so that they don't have to come in. There's a lot of service that's e-service out there for them. And that sort of helps drive the traffic down when you know career services and everything you're going to do that gets in the way of your life is available to you. And then you have the wireless everywhere and the DSL at home. It starts to actually let you become a little bit, really appreciate the untethered nature. Okay. So there's a lot of services out there for them. And that, I like that. So what do we think we can do next? I say close because I'm trying to be, you know, provocative. I, I, I think the reality is I'm going to, this is a migration to reducing significantly. Uh, we have 1,150 students. I right now have two labs, and I'll show you some location issues. The two labs have 40 computers. And in the old days, you know, 40 computers to 1,200 kids wasn't a lot. Um, but I'm, I'm down to 40, and I think really all I'm proposing here is just going down to 20. I mean, I'm not going to take it away. Not everybody's you know, bringing their notebook around, and there's some issues there. But the, you know, the way to think about it as a long-term issue, I'm saying close. Because that lets me start to think about reassigning my resources, personnel time, personnel skills. What, do I, what are my expectations of my students? What's my expectations of my faculty? 
and what are my expectations of the facilities and the way that we use them? How am I promoting community if I'm you know, making everything available to in the morning, we're not getting together? So I need to start to think about the lab being reduced or certainly significantly closed. So what, what's going to go on here is I'm going to open up this cafe kind of area and I want to have it be not the traditional Norton Antivirus, Microsoft Office and all the operational stuff. I want to try to identify a set of technologies or skills that I think the students have or that they can teach me that are just beyond what you would necessarily do in law school. Okay? So this would be like doing wireless as an experiment in 1997. It's there, it worked, hey, but it was a little too cost prohibitive, that didn't have quite enough time. I'm trying to identify those things because they know more than me. That's my assumption going in. Now I can no longer see in 30 year plans what's going to go on. Um, let's tap into what they think they're going to do. All right. It's definitely got to be an experiment. Okay, this is, um, I've made the assumption up front. I'm just going to see how this works out. I want to make sure that the students and my staff understand that this is supposed to be a little bit of the fun and the excitement. I've been terribly practical in my entire career about, you know, what's the pedagogical nature, what's the funding, you know, I mean, okay. This is the, it's got to be rationed. This is not going to be 100% of everybody's time, um, but I need to provide a little bit of excitement both for the students and access. I think it's a way to have fun. Um, so with that, I basically wanted to make sure everybody had a different point of view and everybody would start to wear a different hat. And so you know, the idea is you break out, you put on a ball cap, and you clearly have your own cameras, and there's different ways you can start to use these things. And so you know, tag, I would be starting to videotape you. I mean, for instance, in the class, we think, how am I going to mount cameras? How am I going to provide the overhead? How am I going to control it? Now, that's, that's real. But what about if, for instance, cameras were readily available for quick checkout, and you as a friend said, hey, I can't go, I'm sick, would you mind videotaping it? And one day, this is cost, you know, it's not a $1,000 camera, but it's a 300, and I have a pool of them, and you just, your buddy, because it's wireless everywhere, checked it out and said, hey, I'll tape it for you. And they pop out the little DV thing and give it to you. I wasn't involved. The school really wasn't involved other than facilitating you two as peers figuring out how to solve a common problem. I'm on a holiday or something like that. And so, you know, what if I was videotaping you so I could learn on feedback, of course, evaluations on how I was doing in this presentation? What, I mean, it's just that I'm trying to really get outside the box here a little bit. So let me put this away. I just want to make a quick comment on that. Like, then uh, probably half the students would think, you know, I have to go for a match or like a ball game or something. Why don't you take it from me? I'll watch it uh, when I get home. Right. I would still treat that as a, as a community issue, just like in the beginning we had to tell people at church and theaters to turn off your cell phones. And in the beginning, that didn't happen very often, but we're becoming, as a culture and community, a little better with it. Same thing as with wireless. We're still settling in on how that's used in the classroom. The point is still saying, I mean, the school would still have to identify, do you have a mandatory attendance record? Why? Is that for accreditation? I mean, you have to answer some honest questions for yourself. And so I would say that. I mean, I'd say, you know, there could be legitimate or whatever illegitimate or legitimate reasons are, and whatever we agree or disagree whether they're legitimate or not. It also becomes there's then a record because I know she did check it out and she did say she was taping it for you. And I mean, I have to then educate you that says, I know you used it to tape that class. And that's kind of a scary thing too, right? So we, we, you start to actually be able to track what's happening, whether it's right, wrong, or other. We have to now deal with it as a community. And that's why I wanted to tap into that trust of the way we did the wireless notebook and ownership. I said, here's what we're going to do. Here's what I think is going to happen. Well, things happen in any system and you modify and you adapt. So that was a long answer, but I think it's a really good point. It's, it's more the beginning of a process and a different way of doing process than I've done it in the past. All right, what do I think I'm going to need? Um, I talked a little bit about the money, uh, reallocating the hardware and software licenses. Obviously, my replacement cycle gets to be a little different in the labs. The number of computers in the labs gets to be a little different. And the licenses and things that I'm going to be purchasing are digital video editing the quick stuff and you know, maybe Photoshop and things that normally in a tight budget, when I have to provide 60 computers on a three-year replacement cycle with monitors and facilities in space, I can't buy Photoshop because, wait a minute, who's going to teach them to do Photoshop? What are they doing for it in class instead of a flyer for a softball game or something? I mean, you know, 
I can't do that. So I'm not trying to say I'm saving. I'm trying to say I'm reallocating into some experiment. Purposeful play is what they, I call it. Um, I'm going to try to keep a, a guideline of no fee in the beginning, clearly. But as we move along and see what they use and how they use it, I would, uh, I'm not turned off to having a reasonable fee for some service. You know, basic, you know, first hour free, see how it goes. Um, you know, whether it's printing, we all give them some, typically you give them some amount of free printing so the first print, but then there's a reasonable fee from some capital. The idea is not free for anybody every time all the way. Um, I clearly wanted to pick some location stuff, and I'm going to move it right along so that it was uh, near where the students do some casual activity, easy access, good people flow, good traffic. Um, this is, I want to make sure the students understand it's not a help desk. This is not, would you help me install office? This is not, would you help me uh, disinfect my computer? Um, the operating hours, I'm clearly going to have to acknowledge that you know, I can't do this kind of fun stuff at 8 o'clock in the morning necessarily because they won't be there. They might be there at 9.30 or 10, or this might be a 4 in the afternoon to a 6 at night kind of operation. Um, and I'm going to be keeping track of how to make this scalable, flexible, comfortable. I told you about the beaten path. And yeah, I'm going to throw in the food and the drinks, even though it's around computers, because the idea is I want to facilitate some communications that are going on here. Um, let's see. Whoop. Here's my, my hanging around lawyers slide, which is I want to make sure everybody understands this is not a guaranteed service. This is, you know, for fun. All the full disclaimers. Um, basically, full disclosure. This is what I treat the incoming students. I tell them what's expected of them. And the idea is supposed to be if you have your expectations up front, things won't happen bad in the end. Um, one of the things I'll do, we have a law bundle. It's, you know, you can quickly re-image. And the idea, I think, is I can reduce the risk if I have to do client installs of software that may actually blow the machine up, is I want to make sure I can say, I've given you a law. You have the law bundle. Worst case, all your files are on the network, saved, stored up, backed up, and all that, right? I mean, there's nothing on your computer that can't be re-imaged if this totally goes up in smoke. And if that scares you, Thank you. Please no. You know, but if, if but if you understand that and you want to engage in this activity, well, we'll give it a shot. That's the informed consent, or hopefully informed consent. If I find out they don't understand what I just said, I'll back off on what I, I start to support. But they're pretty good about it. I, I got to give them credit. They know what's going on. They've been doing this computer stuff for a long time now. Um, I'm not going to restrict it like I typically have to to academic activities. This can be to indirectly help their academic work by freeing them up to uh, not have to spend so much time figuring out where their friends are going to meet. Um, so keeping it flexible. And my idea is to observe, and even if they're using it in a non-academic way, that last point was just trying to say I might find academic uses for it. Okay. Materials, methods, where am I going to do it, and some interesting equipment, and then that will be the end of it. So let me sort of blur through this. Um, let's see. Materials and methods. I'm going to use some equipment um, and some stuff that's not quite there and ready for release. I'm willing to take some experiment on my part. Uh, I'm going to try to look and use equipment that's more at the consumer level, like I, this, this Sony camera. I'm not necessarily going to try to put price tags and invest in stuff that's super high level because, hey, it may not work even at the high level. Why not fail for cheap instead of fail for expensive? Um, and I want also stuff that if it works, they have an opportunity potentially of you know, scaling up and buying it themselves and not have to go through me. I'm not looking to you know, have them looking to me for everything here. Um, I have two kinds of things I'm going to do, stuff that's student-based on their computer and stuff that the law school is going to make an investment in it. So I should have put this slide on a, this last piece on its own slide because it's not quite related to the technologies piece. Um, even if it's dumb stuff like instant messaging and, and how they're using it, a lot of them are doing it already, right? But what about the people who aren't? I mean, I've got 360 kids. Let me take a good guess and say 300 of them have IM and they're using it in their own way. Maybe the cult, I want to talk to the 60 who are not doing it and are wishing they were. Well, now, you know, I'll take a look at that with them and see how they're using it. And then hopefully I can see how they're using it that might be helpful in the school. Um, I put up in that meeting Roger Wilco. Again, I don't know why they would necessarily need to do that, um, but I'll put it out there, show it to them, and if they have an idea, I'll, I'll try to do with it. Roger Wilco was really not a great product, per se. It's just a walkie-talkie, asynchronous kind of communication chat. And the way to think of that is it's just, you know, I, I think of it as instant messenger with voice. Instead of having to type, 
maybe the next thing is you can actually be talking to somebody. Now, in the middle of the class, that would be really tough. And why they'd want to do it, and where they would do it, and when it would make sense to hear the voice instead of typing, I have no idea. But I'd try. Um, of course, we all know about MP3s and how they're doing that. Maybe there's a way I can work with them on when they download and where they download, and you know, modify the behavior a little bit. I, I don't know. Um, calendaring and cell phones, maybe there's a better way to sync up with the directory information and calendar from the law web to their cell phones or their new coming PDAs and stuff like that. Make it easy. I don't know that they need to do it. Again, uh, text messaging, that would be something that I would think of, which is, you know, a lot of them are interested if you're doing course enrollment and you run it in the back office and it's done. Or if career services runs a scheduling system or whatever and it's done, they're pretty good with wireless being everywhere, going to the web and checking out the results. But it's very easy for me if they registered, which is a security issue and all that, if they registered their cell phone number with me and they had text messaging, I could page them. I mean, I could send out the page that just says, career services scheduling done and watch everybody flip over to the course interview schedule and then go to the U.S. Airways to get their tickets. Um, again, that could happen. I don't know why. <laughs> um, that's stuff that would have happened on the student side. But I'm taking a look at doing on the law school investment side is taking a look at um, improving the scanning that we've had, uh, which I'd use some old equipment, and I'll show you a little bit of the new equipment. I have some old, older cameras. They're still good, but older cameras I could start to work with if they wanted to do still photography. I also have um, some old equipment for some digital photo editing and software and whatnot that I could use, so that's a good way to get it up, and if I use it, I could take a look at upgrading. Um, and I have some new equipment. Again, I'll show you with high-speed black and white color printing scanning, which is really now called scanning to print because they're no longer copiers. The, um, and I'll also tell you a little bit about that. And uh, video capturing and editing and all that, all the moot courtrooms, the threat, you know, you're, you're going to digital on your video recording. The stuff is smaller, it's lightweight, it's more portable. If it's summer, if it's not a session in the moot court, and you've got one back here, you know, we've seen some rooms where it's on a tripod and I'm not using it. If I have trust, I have a scheduling system and low overhead, why not let them use it even if it's just during business hours, meaning that you're here to retrieve it at the end of the day and it's not a night and weekend thing. I can think of some ways to actually use the equipment more and get it out there. If they use it, that's great. If they use it a lot, maybe it's a fee. I don't know. Um, and I'm being mindful of what Central University and other places can do in a much more expansive area for digital collections, video editing, and stuff like that. So I'm just providing convenience, location, and a law school specific with a law school focus, and if it gets beyond what I can do, then I'll still refer them up. I'm not trying to replicate any services. It's just that right now, sending them over there is no good. Darn. Um, well, law school, it's, just, it's not the scale. This is a 400-foot range right here to give you a sense that we have like 280,000 square feet for all these people. And what I'm going to do, I, have, I was part of the building. I had a little bit of input into it. There's two locations that I'm going to use. This is where we have, I'll show you a little picture. This is a high atrium place, you know, a lot of student foot traffic, casual. We have a servery, you know, that's where you can get your lunch. You can hang out. You can do right in here. And a patio is where you can eat. You've got TV, microwaves, food, you know, lots of traffic, CV scene, social stuff. Um, it's not around the classrooms or anything like that. That's where I'll do the student-based stuff. I can sit there with my Greenberry Starbucks coffee, my wireless notebook, and we can talk about cell phones and things that you do on your own notebook computer. Uh, what I have here, conveniently and still local within the traffic flow, because everything for us flows around this quad, is I have the, the, what was the copy center in the old days, which now has these digital copy or scanner doohickeys, and I had one lab right here, the 20-person lab, that's where I'll put the law school based stuff. Now being a chicken, how do I, why did I pick this particular one? Last December, I used five or 10 of the 20 computers for exam you know, support. And when I put them back, I didn't plug them in. And I waited the whole term to see if I'd get a thumb down or whatever in the student newspaper where they'd say, how dare you know, ITC not have 10 of their computers? Well, nobody cared. I mean, that's my, I mean, they weren't used. And they didn't need them, so I'll take those stations out, and that's where I can start to put the, you know, the higher end camera and digital video editing stuff. So I, I, I use the numbers, but I also go with story. This is the bad photo, but the idea is, you know, CV scene, nice place to hang, casual. 
and facilitate stuff. And that's just a sorry a standard web or a lab. Nothing there. It's easy to reconfigure. It's flexible space. It's a 20 by 40. It's a good rectangular space. So that's not too bad. I think I have a good location there. And in 30 seconds or less, uh, the implications this is the last slide. Good news. Um, I can now put a little few, few extra features that I wouldn't put in a lab if the lab was never really experimental. I'm trying to make an experimental now. Uh, a little bit larger monitor, better places to scan, a little bit better places to get help, a little better place to hang out, a little better place with me. I intend to do this myself. It's a little easier when a student wants to suck up 40 minutes of time for me to say, no, I've got to go, and they actually believe it, whereas you know, tech support, it's a little harder to get out of that mess. Um, and I'll keep an eye on it. The last piece there is as we, if this starts to work and you get into high bandwidth video streaming and stuff like that, it's going to start to come back to me on a practical level, so I need to t pay attention to the 802.11e standard. Now, G is coming out where it was just ratified, and we'll roll that out this year for bandwidth issues as well. So I'm not trying to get myself way out there and then not be able to serve it as it comes along. And boy, that's 20 <laughs> seconds over, but... Uh, the, you've seen the camera, and the idea is we've got 12 of these puppies. They're just all around for color scanning, printing. The idea is a click is a click, so it's not copy center copying. So we can take a look at the whole 9 million pages that we image, impressions, and that brings down your cost per price. It's all software electronically driven, so the idea is no matter what station you work up to, your own notebook or whatever, you can print copy whatever information you've stored. So it's very easy to do this stuff. And with barbecue on the way. If there are any questions, I'll certainly hang for a moment, but uh, I think that's it. Thank you. It's like a political nightmare to go against the central networking guys. They're still totally against implementing a wireless, and we are putting a lot of iron in saying that a lot of amateur.